Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the afternoon breakout session. If you are in the right place, if you are here to hear about student engagement, thank you so much to, uh, for choosing to spend the next uh, 75 minutes with us. We're going to be together until about 1.30. And just some information in terms of logistics. Hopefully everybody was able to hear the music. You can hear my voice and you can see the slides. We do have a packed agenda for our time together. And so just a quick um, piece of advice, if you wouldn't mind doing this for me, if you haven't already done so, if you will go ahead and change your screen name so that it reflects your organization, that would be very helpful. And to do that, you just hover over your thumbnail and click on those three dots, that chai dot icon, and then just choose rename. And you can edit that and add your institution or organization. That would be so helpful. Thank you very much. And just to let you know that this session is being recorded. So those of us, or those who could not join, will be able to watch this recording later. And then those who are here and you wanna share this recording with your colleagues, you're more than welcome to do that. And then because we are in Zoom, and I think at this point, many of us are familiar with the features, I invite you to use the chat box to enter any questions in there that you might have throughout the session. We may not be able to answer all of them given the time, but I would personally definitely make sure that I go back and look at the questions and send an email to you and give you that answer. We don't get to it during the session. And I'll go ahead and move into the slides and let's get started. All right, so the title for the session is Accelerating Engagement. Let's ace the school year. And my name is T. Mai Dong. I am the Director of Community Solutions with E3 Alliance. And I'm so excited to be able to share with you our ACE messaging, our overarching ACE messaging, and be able to unpack that with you and how we think this new messaging, this new campaign really will help increase student engagement as we move into a new school year. And I do want to just introduce my support buddy. We have tech support from Carrie. They said you're supposed to keep your video off as tech support, Carrie, but I don't believe in that. Would you mind just unmuting and say hello quickly? Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much, Carrie, for supporting me in this way. And then I have some wonderful guest speakers. They're going to be also sharing their story with you throughout the session. And I'm really excited and grateful that they are here. And I'll introduce them right before they speak. All right, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and continue to the next slide. So we have an essential question on the screen here, and I'll read it for you if you don't mind. In your role, what can you do to accelerate change using an inclusive approach? And so it's not for you to answer right now. It's really just to plant that seed and get you thinking about what can you do so that we can accelerate change together, which is the theme for our summit. So just be thinking about that as we move through the session. And if you are considered a social media influencer, I highly encourage you to get on your social media platform of choice, use hashtag E3Blueprint to share any ideas, thoughts, reactions to what you learned today in our time together. And there also will be time for reflection as well, guided reflection as we move through the slide. And so I'm gonna go ahead and move into the three components of our session. It's gonna be comprised of three main sections. As I said before, I'm excited to be able to explain to you this ACE messaging that we have launched and how that ties to these things that you see on the screen that we believe that if we are able to accelerate change in the area of attendance and really looking at attendance from a comprehensive view that it's not just attendance by itself but is thinking about helping students commit and engage we can actually increase attendance and then we can actually help kids and students commit better if we're able to strengthen relationships between the school and family and then lastly, we can help them engage with their learning if we continue to focus on equitable outcomes going forward. And so we're gonna be able to look at those three when we think about how to accelerate change using inclusive approach. And so this leads to our objectives for the session. And you'll see there on the screen for you. And I'm just gonna invite some person, some random person from our group here, which attendee feels brave and would like to unmute and just read those for us. Anybody out there, feel free to unmute and just go for it. Uh, to learn about efforts aimed at increasing attendance, commitment, and engagement. To learn about efforts aimed at strengthening school family relationships. To learn about efforts aimed at delivering equitable outcomes. To make the connection between data, knowledge, and action. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tegwin, for reading those for us. And so you'll see those first three bullets correspond to the 
components that we saw on this slide before, the fourth slide is a sort of spoiler alert. And so as we look at each of those components, we're actually gonna move through a very similar format to make it easier for you to digest a lot of this information. So I will share with you some data. We'll see how the data leads to some knowledge that we co-construct together. And then there'll be time for reflection toward action. Perfect. All right, so we do have a couple of audience participation activities before we move into the meat of the slides. And so you see on the screen here, you have three ways to complete this poll for me. And Carrie's gonna paste into the chat box the actual link that you can paste into your browser. If you're someone who loves to use your barcode scanner, feel free, feel free to grab that QR code, or you can actually just go to mentee.com and, and answer this code or enter the code rather. It's gonna ask you for one question and just really identify your role so we can know who's in the room with us. And I'll pause and give you a little bit of time to do that. And my friends, this is where we cross our fingers and pray that technology works beautifully. And so hopefully as people are submitting their answers, we'll see the roles and the breakout populate on our screen here in the live results. And go back to the slide before and see. And so if folks are entering the responses and hitting submit, I'm hoping it'll populate here. All right, so it may not be working as it was supposed to work. So what I'll do is just ask you to put that into the chat box. That's always our nice alternative there. So if you don't mind just putting in the chat box your role, and then that way we'll have a good picture of who's here. And if for some reason you don't see your particular role on the screen, please make sure that you also add that in the chat box as well. All right. Thank you so much for participating. And I'm sorry that this did not work out as beautifully as it was meant to, but I think at this point, right, 15 months of doing this remotely, we are prepared for anything, my friends. Everything's going to keep moving forward here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and skip this one, but I'm going to do it a different way. So we had a word cloud here from Menti that I wanted you to think about. When you think about student engagement, what are those words that come to mind? So instead of using mentee, again, would you just put into the chat box, what are the words that come to mind when you think about student engagement? And I would love to see those populate in the chat box. Collaboration, student voice, excellent. Love of learning. Connectedness. Already I'm seeing some commonalities in the words that are coming across. Student agency, relevance, beautiful. Relationships again, I love it. Perfect. Thank you all so much. And keep putting those through, sending those through. You're not limited just to just one. So feel free to keep entering those. Thank you so much for participating in that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the very first section here, which is attendance, commitment and engagement. And so when we think about this, there are so many wonderful efforts that have been taking place across the Central Texas region to really work on increasing attendance. And we know that because of the pandemic, attendance definitely looks different and feels different. And so the really cool thing is before COVID even happened, we had an attendance task force already in place. It was called Missing School Matters. And there was conversation around how we can take that Missing School Matters and move it to something that was a little bit more additive, a little bit more strength-based. And so we we're able to come up with this ACE mess messaging, this ACE tagline, where ACE stands for attend, commit, and engage. And it's really about helping students ACE their school year in these three different contexts. And so this ACE task force was born and we looked at root causes around attendance and what was really, what were the factors that were preventing students from attending school. And we came up with the list of factors and I worked with the task force and the task force co-chairs to see, and we did some sort of affinity diagram exercise to see what categories emerged. And there were four priority areas that emerged. And two of those were school culture and climate, and then also 
family culture and environment. And we felt those were the two that were the most important that we wanted to prioritize because we desperately wanted to find a way to be able to connect school and family so that we could better serve our students. And that resulted in a brand new ACE website brand new ACE resources that school staff, district staff could use to engage with their students and families. And those are free work resources available on the ACE website. And we'll be able to share a link for that at the end of the session today. But we even went a step further, worked with the task force and we said, well, let's really think about the experiences that we had this past year and figure out what are some recommendations that we can actually strategize around and operationalize. And so that we could see how to really better serve our students and families. And we came up with eight categories, and some of those categories include really making sure home visits are more robust, making sure that we are nurturing all student groups as we're serving, and then making sure that we also appreciate the family dynamics. And I love what someone in the panel has said about not making those assumptions, right, about students and families. And when you think about attendance, that might be easy to do. And so really, um, the beauty behind this is that the recommendations allow districts to be able to think about how they can strategize and really put this into practice so that as we move into the new school year, we're on good foundation on how to serve our students and parents and really making that in a way that is strength-based and really a comprehensive view. And so speaking of that comprehensive view and approach toward attendance, I love to be able to share this tagline with you. And it's really this messaging that we've launched and we're so proud of it as a way to really strengthen that partnership between schools and families. So we say we want students to attend, it really is for them to attend in either modality with this idea and this feeling of being safe and belonging and wellness. And when we say we want students to commit, we think that we can they can commit better if they feel connected to what they're learning, connected to the school environment. And then we really think that they can engage if we do a better job of making sure that they come to school knowing that the adults around them feel that they can be successful and feel that they can be efficacious in their learning. So really for us, attendance is not just about roll call. It's not just about checking and make sure there are warm bodies in the seats or bodies that have logged on to Zoom, but really this comprehensive approach. And so for this point, we're gonna actually just focus on the attendance piece. And I can't wait to share with you the efforts that are happening around how to increase attendance. But first, as I said, we're gonna start with data because this is what E3 does, we've got data. And so the first slide here is about Actually, it shows a correlation between students who are not graduating on time and chronic absenteeism. And so just a quick um, definition of chronic absenteeism. So students are considered chronically absent if they are absent 18 days or more out of the school year. So if they miss more than 10% of the school year, they're chronically absent. And so just to orient you to the slide, on the left-hand side, you have percentage of students who did not graduate on time. And we're looking at the ninth grade cohort of the class of 2018. So for ninth graders during this year. And then at the bottom, you'll see the number of days they missed. And the big takeaway from this slide is, those students who only missed zero to five days, 4% did not graduate on time. However, when you think about those students who were chronically absent, and these students in particular for this data slide who had more than 20 absences, almost half of them did not graduate on time. So I hope this conveys that urgency around and behind why we wanna make sure that we're focusing on attendance and concentrating our efforts around this. On this slide right here, you see chronic absence for the region over time, but now it's broken down by student groups. And so on the left-hand side, this is now the percentage of students who are chronically absent. And at the bottom on the horizontal axis, you see the years there, so you can see over time. And you can see just by looking at the trend lines that we actually have a bright spot here, right? If you see the percentage of students who are chronically absent took, de declined, right, in the last year. And so that actually is good news there. Um, now we know that from 2019 and 2020, there are probably some adjustments here, maybe some caution that needs to be considered, just cons thinking about how attendance was reported in very new and different ways this past year. But still, I'm going to take that as optimistic that the chronic absence percentage has decreased. But what I do want to point out, though, is the top three line graphs, which represent our student groups. And so you can see there which of those groups that we definitely want to make sure that we attend to. And so at the top, you see our students from low income households. And then in that purple, you see our black students and Hispanic students. So those students are experiencing higher percentages of chronic absenteeism. So this is definitely where we want to focus our efforts going forward. And on this slide right here, this is a summary slide from TEA. TEA asked districts to report the engagement of their students. And so if you look at the top there, Fully engaged means that during the pandemic year, and this is specific to 
the last few months when the COVID, when COVID hit of the spring of 2020. And so fully engaged means that students and families were being responsive to emails from administrators, they were submitting assignments. And then the no or lost engagement, no or lost contact, I think is straight, pretty straightforward. They were not submitting assignments and they were not responding to any of the emails. And so you can see those percentages for the state. And then on the second half of the slide there, you'll see that it's broken down again by student groups. And I'll just point out that when we're looking at fully engaged, you'll see that the percentage of students who are black and Hispanic is smaller or lower than for, the, uh, for white and Asian students in terms of them being fully engaged during this time period. So that was a lot of data. I wanna give you an opportunity now to just pause for a second and just reflect. And so considering the data shared, why is it important for us to really concentrate our efforts around attendance and really helping students feel that they are safe, that they belong when they log on to the virtual setting or when they come back in person um, to the on-campus setting. And so what I'd like you to do is on the right-hand side, I offer you a protocol for reflecting and for processing the data. So if you think about the six thinking hats that you see on the screen, choose one of these hats that you wanna just put on virtually for this time, and then think about the data that I just shared with you, and then just pop your reflection into the chat box. We'll give you a few minutes to do that. And then I'll ask if there's one volunteer that would be brave enough to share into the space, what your thoughts are using any of these hats. And again, you don't have to, this is just something that I offer you, but I would love to hear from one person in the room, what your thoughts are about the data we just shared around attendance and what that means for us. I'll pause and let everybody have a second to put that into the chat box. And if there's anyone that has a thought right off the bat that just wants to share, feel free to unmute and do so. I'd love to hear your ideas and your insights. And I see a question coming in from Joy. What factors cause and mark the decrease in absenteeism in 2020? So are we talking about the second slide, Joy, that shows the chronic absenteeism over time? So remember, that's the percentage of chronic absenteeism. So if it dipped, it means that absenteeism actually decreased, right? And so we want, we want to be optimistic and hopeful about that. Um, because we, since folks were reporting the attendance and really being more strategic in how that attendance was being reported, we think that that might be the reason for it. But we also, again, want to just be, be cautious of that because um, the attendance was reported in so many various ways and various times uh, that we want to just sort of take that with a grain of salt. Are there any other reflections that are coming in through the chat box? Okay. All right. Okay. So while you're still reflecting and entering in the chat box, feel free to do that. I don't want to disrupt that or interrupt that because I know with data, sometimes it takes a while for it to sit and process before you can actually um, verbalize something and verbalize a reaction to it. So feel free to continue doing that. But now I'm going to go ahead and move into the next slide, which is probably my favorite slide. Um, these are the spotlights that we're going to do as part of the session where we actually get to hear from one of our partners. And the thing about E3 is even though we have access to this data, what we love is that we were able to partner with practitioners, our educational practitioners, in pre-K-12, in higher ed, so that they can help us co-construct the story around that data. And then that leads to action that is needed for us to be able to change that data narrative in behalf, on behalf of students. And so at this point, I'm gonna invite Joe DeLeon from Hedo ISD. He works as a parent support specialist there. And Joe, if you don't mind, go ahead and unmute. And we would love for you to share your story about what you've done in your district and with your teams to help students attend with this feeling of wellness, safety, and belonging. Thank you so, so much. I'm totally excited about this. I remember when, when the COVID hit, uh, I was during that spring break about a year and a half ago, I believe. And uh, it totally threw a big wrench in our spring break. We had no spring break. So in the admin office, we got to work immediately and trying to figure out a plan of what we could do to get Chromebooks off to students, knowing that uh, 
state had shut down the schools for meanwhile. And then um, the great thing is that we had already ordered thousands of Chromebooks that came in that week. So we were just really blessed through that. So we got out there, we got the Chromebooks in the people's hands. I got out there in meeting parents and discussing with them what was going on um, or what we knew possibly might be the, the plan. And of course we stayed open. Once the schools were allowed to go open, we stayed open through all that time. So we were kind of balanced between virtual and, um, and in person. But then we started seeing that after a, a few weeks, um, the absenteeism started growing. People started dropping out of those virtual classrooms. So one of the things that we did immediately was uh, we, we developed a, a form for teachers, counselors, uh, principals to fill out when they wanted us to, to check up on a family or something. So they filled out the form and then we'd have somebody in that school's admin, a teacher or counselor to go with us to see what's going on with the family. So we immediately started doing that and we realized that a lot of them was lack of internet, you know, or couldn't afford internet. So at that point, um, we got a whole bunch of uh, hotspots and I will personally deliver those hotspots to the people in order for them to, to, to get on and start doing that. And then of course we, we started um, to see that many parents were afraid of the COVID, you know, and they did not want their students to go on campus, even though my student wanted to go on site and I, I went to their homes, I sat in their living rooms and explained to them that our schools are safe. I said, we have hardly no cases to where one student has uh, spread COVID to another student. You know, all uh, the cases that have developed, it was outside of the school. I let them know that we hired extra people to come clean between classes and all of that. And, and we had all of the, I call it the germ juice, placed everywhere for them to do that. And, and just convincing the, the parents um, that it was gonna be safe if their child went to school was something that was totally, totally amazing. Once I, I, I was able to get that parent's confidence, you know, they would allow the students to, to go in. I even had one parent, it was really, really funny because I kept calling him and like, man, we, we really need your student at home. And I said, you know, can I meet you at your house? And he's like, well, I don't get home till around six or, or seven. I said, I'll get, I'll be there at that time. And I sat with him and, and talked to him. And he looked at me and he's like, Mr. De Leon, can you guarantee me that your child will not get COVID? I said, I cannot guarantee you that your child will not get COVID. I said, but I can guarantee you that your child's grades will go up, you know? And then uh, he said, okay, I'll send my, my child. And then I checked up with him a week later and asked him, how's your boy enjoying school? And he's like, he loves it. You see, he gets out there 15 minutes before the bus is to come and, and he's ready to go. And I started seeing that pattern, you know, over and over and over that once the, the student got on the campus, they're able to get the help that they need. And, and literally the percentage of people uh, passing on campus is way above those that were just at home. So I, I took it upon myself to start visiting those people uh, with chronic absences. 20 and before I had the report run on that. And then I took those, and I started calling, I started visiting people and just trying to see what, what's going on. You know, and granted there, there were some um, cases that, you know, the kids were just being lazy. You know, mom and dad would go to work and, and the child was telling mom and dad, yeah, I did my school, but they hadn't, you know. But then also I had many uh, students who were uh, suffering through the mental illness you know, or just being just stuck at home and not being able to go anywhere. And then I was able to talk to parents, you know, we have something for that. We have counselors who can deal with that. We have programs that can help you or, or you, your student, you know, with our mental health, you know, and that was something that we made it so clear. And of course, a lot of things came up, well, what is it going to cost me? It's like, it's not going to cost you anything, you know, just know that if they come on campus, that help will be there. So what I did was any obstacle that came in the way, um, I would try to remove that, that obstacle from the child attendant of uh, the campus. We had a case, and I've been able to speak on, on this case several times, where uh, I went to do a home visit, and the house was infested with bees. I'm talking 70,000 bees. You know, I went, and then I st stood at the porch, and I saw these bees, and then I'm like, I'm out of here. I went back to the car, 
to the car and, and I called uh, the grandmother because that's where the, the children were staying with. I said, ma'am, I went and knocked on the door, but all these bees are everywhere. And she's like, no, Zip, we, we don't go through that door. And, and, and then we started talking about the kids in school. She said, well, the kids' laptop are inside the house, but we moved out of the house because there are so many bees in there. And I'm like, well, how long have those bees uh, been there? You know, she said, uh, it's, they've been in over a year is what they were told. And they finally just started showing themselves. So I'm like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get you a beekeeper and go out and we're gonna remove that obstacle out the way. Of course, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, how am I gonna pay for this? I know no beekeeper. So I went back to my office, I found a beekeeper, I found an organization that was willing to pay to have the bees removed. And that day they started removing the bees. You know, and then it was really, really great because grandma was so excited. The kids were excited that they could get back in their laptop. And I told grandma this. I said, grandma, you know what would be really, really great if your girls could just go to the campus and go into class in person. And she's like, Mr. DeLeon, you know what? Because of what you've done for us, my uh, granddaughters will be in school and campus. You know, and, and that worked out so, so well. So they were able uh, to just start on campus and just started the success started going up the grade started going up transportation issues I have meaning though well the bus doesn't stop where we are and i'm like you know what i, I can solve that problem and i call transportation and just let them know you know what we need a bus to go pick these kids up and they're like well it's going to take a couple of days like no tomorrow we need these buses to pick up uh, these kids so that worked out well and one of the things that i'm working right now is i'm working with the city of Hutto in, in uh, developing a, a big um, city map. And then Huddle is really growing. So we're looking at all the areas that Huddle is gonna be annexing and all of that and getting the street names. And then what I'm doing, I, I'm taking uh, all the chronic absentees and starting plotting where they are and just looking for those clusters. And then once I see those clusters, just trying to figure out, okay, what led to them being absent in that area of town or what caused that and then solve those issues. Because we all know once the student is on campus and they uh, take part of the classes, they straight they tend to start doing better in school. And when they do better in school, they start loving school more. You know, and we know that the kids are students, they're contagious within each other. So you, they hear one that's enjoying school, the other one's gonna start enjoying school. So um, I know only have five minutes, I can speak like forever, but um, <laughs> that's me here at Huddle. Attendance is important. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your story. There were so many insights in that share that I wanted to just address and speak to you as well. But what I heard too is just this, the sense of safety that you were able to provide. Because I think even before COVID, there was this need to provide that psychological safety for our students, right? So that they could feel ready to learn. But because of the pandemic, this added this layer of physical safety as well that we need to provide for students and families. And what I love what I heard you say too is that you didn't go and just, you know, you didn't just do the outreach and then said, okay, check. I made contact with so-and-so, but you actually also followed up with them too to see how they were doing. And that example with the bees is perfect because I, you know, if we're thinking about doing our self-check and thinking about assumptions, I would never say, oh, those kids are not coming to school because they probably have a bee problem, right? So it's such a good example of the the things that are happening, the experiences that our families are going through and that we just have no idea of. So thank you so much, Joe, for sharing that. And so I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide. This is going to take us to our reflection for this particular segment as we're talking about attendance, commitment, and engagement. And I'm going to ask Carrie to post, to paste rather, the link to our Padlet wall into the chat box. And you can feel free to open up that Padlet. On the first column, you'll see it's labeled attendance, commitment, and engagement. So thinking about what you learned today in terms of the data around attendance, what you heard Joe share, in your role, what is it that you can do to help accelerate change? And for us, change in this particular instance is reviewing attendance as being more comprehensive, more than just attendance, but really providing that sense of wellness, safety, and belonging for students. And so go ahead and go to the Padlet and enter that reflection. I'm gonna give me a little bit of time to do that. Excellent, I'm seeing some good comments in the chat box as well. 
And I have to, uh, to call out Patricia, I love your comment about how even though students are attending and TEA is reporting them as being engaged because that's how they ask districts to report, right? But are they really engaged? Are they, are they being compliant? Are they submitting? Are they really engaged in the learning? So thank you for bringing that up. All right, so now we're gonna move into the next segment, which is really how can we accelerate and amplify relationships between school and family, which is what I shared before, was two of the priority areas that we came up as a task force that we wanted to concentrate on last year. And so again, many things happening in the region to help strengthen school and family relationships. And you'll see there on the screen, that's just a recap of what we talked before about what the ACE task force is doing. But what I wanted to do now is really look at an example that's related to math to help make this more concrete for you. I think the ACE messaging and the ACE campaign is overarching because it is that comprehensive approach. It does allow us to really think about how we're delivering instruction so that students are wanting to attend school. And so the math context provides a good example because Math is challenging. There's this perception that all, all, not all students can do math or be successful in math. And so it is really hard to get students to be engaged and excited about it. But we have efforts that are happening and I can't wait to share those with you. And if you look at the very last bullet, our Pathways of Promise initiative that E3 has that I have the pleasure of working with is really around how can we open up access so that students all students have access to advanced math because we have data that tells us that if students are able to matriculate to more rigorous math courses when they get to high school, the chances of them being successful in the post-secondary space is greater. And so there are some wonderful things that we're doing as part of that Pathways of Promise initiative, and I'm going to share those with you. And I will say just a little caveat, the work that we're doing in terms of the focus group interviews and in terms of culturally relevant pedagogy that we're trying to bring in the space, it really really is still in its nascent infancy stage. And so the data that I do have to share with you, it's very qual it's qualitative, but it's very preliminary as well. So just a little caveat moving forward. And so I'm gonna return back to the tagline here, the ACE messaging, and really we're gonna focus now on that C for commit. So how can we help students commit um, and, and really feel like they're connected to, uh, to what's being taught and to what's being delivered in the classroom? So I do wanna give you just a quick introduction to culturally responsive pedagogy, CRP. You'll see the definitions there on the screen and I'll let you read those quietly to yourself that we are very excited to be able to partner with Dr. Keflin Brown. He was out of UT Austin. And this past year we launched our first inaugural culturally responsive pedagogy CRP cohort, which consisted of two higher ed institutions and four pre-K-12 districts who engaged with workshops and check-in sessions to really learn what is CRP, what are the practices related to being able to deliver this to our students so that they can feel that we are culturally affirming and culturally sustaining their backgrounds. And so looking at this definition, there are some words here that probably pop out to you. And for me, I'm looking at cultural references and then also the students making bridges between who they are, who they wish to become, I think is very powerful. And so I'm gonna move to the next slide and just share with you a summary of CRP practices that we were able to walk away with by engaging in this cohort and the work with Dr. Brown this past year. And at this point, I actually would like you to just kind of see the different components there that you see on the screen. And I would love people to unmute and just tell me what words jump out at you when you think about being culturally responsive, a culturally responsive ed educator, culturally responsive pedagogue, and thinking about how we can support our students in the classroom that are growingly diverse more and more. What are the words that pop out at you? What are the words that resonate with you? Feel free to unmute and share. Or if you'd like, you can also enter in the chat box. Affirming. Mm -hmm. Collaborative. Mm -hmm. And I love the, the inclusive piece here and that word intentionally, intentionally seeks out a diversity of perspectives. You know, I think oftentimes as an educator, we enter the classroom space and you know, we know what it is that we want to teach and we know we have the standards and we have content, we have student expectations, but are we really intentionally thinking about the diversity of the students that are in the room with us? How are we bringing their identities into the space? Any other thoughts on this at all? 
And so just to let you know that we are also going to be continuing with our culturally responsive pedagogy workshops going into the next year. And we'd be opening that up for additional districts and additional institutions of higher ed that wanna join. We really do wanna be able to help build capacity for this work and really build and increase that opportunity for us to, to have students feel like they are connected to school when they show up for school, that they see themselves reflected in the curriculum. And we think doing that will allow us to really accelerate change overall when we're thinking about helping them to ace their school year. And so the next couple of slides reflect a different effort that we've been working on in the Central Texas region. And so part of the Pathways of Promise initiative that I alluded to before, where we are really trying to make sure that all students have access to advanced math, and in particular, just higher skills. So even though we're talking about math in particular, skills is something that transcends all content areas, right? If students have access to those skills of communication, collaboration, digital literacy, creative thinking, problem solving, that will benefit them when they enter that post-secondary realm. And so what you see on the screen here are some examples of student responses from interviews that I had the pleasure of conducting with them. And the context for this is that I interviewed students in middle school, teachers in middle school, and parents who were pursuing eighth grade algebra or seventh grade algebra. And so we asked them a series of questions in different categories. And what you see on the screen here are some student examples of how they responded to barriers that they encountered, and then also what their sense of safety and wellness was. And so I'll give you a second just to reflect on this. And again, feel free to react in the chat box, or if you want to unmute, feel free to share something that jumps out at you when you look at these student responses, because they are, they give us good insight into what we want to do in terms of student engagement and really getting into that glimpse of what their experience is as a student. I know the one thing that jumps out for me is just this idea of that teacher, right? That relationship with the teacher and how they're able to facilitate the classroom in a way that helps that student feel like they're a part of this community and they bring in stories about themselves. And really it's about building those relationships, right? That relationship between teacher and student. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide. Here we have a couple of more student examples in terms of the questions that were asked about them. And I'm gonna see if anybody noticed something that was particularly surprising in these responses that you see on the screen here. And if you catch it, feel free to unmute because I'd love to hear it. Anybody? Uh, the point about what the teacher likes mm -hmm. um, instead of uh, thinking about what the student would like. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that, Taiwan. That was particularly surprising to me too, how the student was saying that the learning was not personalized to them, but that was actually okay because that could lead to bullying. So I thought this very, very, very telling and very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I also love this question. My favorite part was asking this question, what does it mean for them to be successful? And it wasn't always about getting good grades. And you look at this student in particular, it was really about being able to get at that level where they're not afraid anymore. They're able to take the risk. They're able to fail forward. Um, and then that idea of being prepared for the next class too. So I just love that it wasn't always about getting a good grade, getting an A, that it meant something more to these students. Okay, awesome. All right, so now, Thinking about those responses and thinking about the culturally responsive pedagogy efforts, just another option, another opportunity rather for you to reflect. And if you want, again, you can choose the same hat as before, you can use a different hat, but just think about the, the, the data in particular. In this case, it was very qualitative, right? It was really just a glimpse into the students' lived experiences around that advanced math experience in middle school. So what are some reflections and what are some thoughts? And again, I'll invite you to put those into the chat box. And if anybody wants to share with the, with the group, feel free to do so. I'm feeling like we're kind of a shy group this afternoon. Might be maybe just some food coma hitting here after lunch. I would love to hear voices if anybody wants to share the reflection.
we do have some good comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just pulled up the chat right now. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, and thank you so much for sharing that, Kathy, too. And there were, you know, we were able to have those discussions about what those obstacles were. And as you can imagine, the students were very candid in their responses, too. And a lot of it really did point to this past year being a COVID year. And so being able to go back in person, and this echoes what Joe was sharing before, is that they really struggled in that virtual space. And of course, this is not across the board, not for everybody, but the, the general primary consensus is that they really struggle when they were learning virtually, when they were able to go back in person, it was completely different. They were felt like they were actually be able to not only feel connected to what was being taught, but really did cement their ability to feel like they belonged in that classroom and belonged to part of the community again. Excellent, thank you guys so much. I guess, and just real quick, I'd like to echo that. I, th I think it was sort of interesting to think how the MIT in this, in all these cases, was was literally as you said it was like a connection like i think we think about like a kid tuning and tuning out but it in some sense it there was it, it was this connection with the teacher or connection with the information that that was like a signal of commitment as opposed to like just like watching or you know not not watching Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joe. And that also makes me think about just what our student panelists were sharing too, right? They really did make that point of talking about how that connection with the adult was really supportive and was really helpful to allow them to navigate that space and navigate those challenges. Thank you. All right. So again, we arrive at one of my favorite times of the session. We have another spotlight here with a partner. And for this time, I want to invite Kathy Alexander, who is our coordinator of secondary mathematics from Hayes, to share. Hayes has participated in numerous opportunities, professional learning opportunities that we've had as part of our Pathways of Promise initiative. So Kathy, feel free to unmute and please share your story about what you and your team has done to help students feel like they are committed. Um, they can commit to education because they feel connected to what's being taught. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you said, my name is Kathy Alexander, and we have been involved with POP and with uh, Data Center and E3, and we have done all kinds of professional development. And um, you know, we felt like in the pandemic, maybe things would would stagnate and we would be stuck. But it seems like we had so many opportunities to to learn new things and try to put them together. Um, we also just started uh, this last year um, our NAEP grant, and so we had a lot of uh, campuses working with that. Uh, so what I wanted to, to spotlight uh, as far as committing is some of our work in our advanced math pathways. So even prior to all of this, we I had re uh, worked and worked on policies to help give students additional opportunities to jump into that advanced math pathway so we could get them to algebra in eighth grade. Um, and then with COVID, we've had all these, um, you know, challenges with connections and building relationships. So looking forward with some of the things we have learned over the last year, we really wanted to get especially our incoming sixth graders right on the right path for advanced math and make sure that they would be successful. So one of our middle schools that was part of our NAEP project uh, really took this to heart. Our principal um, at that campus did a video to parents and she shared that at her parent nights to get parents um, an understanding of where students you know what what this pathway looked like and trying to get additional students involved um, and sent that out to our fifth grade parents and went to parent nights did it virtually any any way we could get in front of them in addition our sixth grade and um, advanced teacher at that campus went to those elementary schools for at least the students that were in person to recruit to energize them to get them excited about math and our enrollment for uh, advanced math has significantly increased for next year, even in this crazy time. Um, and then in order to try to continue that, that relationship between the student and the teacher and the parents, we are doing two week advanced math camps in conjunction with our summer school. Um, and I was over there the last couple of days and he is just like he he took the kids on a tour of the school. He's getting them doing breakout room, like the breakout um, activities. Um, and so he's just getting them energized and doing some fun things with math, 
starting to introduce some vocabulary and some of the strategies um, and just getting that connection started. So then when we get them in the fall, we can maybe overcome some of those issues, you know, be ahead of the game, so to speak, um, to get them back acclimated into being at school, being in person, interacting with their peers and um, having the support of the in-person teacher. Um, so I feel like that connection was important and we just, you know, it's hard to fix all of the other places and we are still working to do a lot of things, but we're like, okay, we're going to start fresh with this incoming sixth grade class, get them set going forward. Um, and then hopefully we can take that pilot process and expand it across the district so that we can reach all of the, all of the students that we know can be successful on that pathway, but just need to have that confidence in themselves. Perfect. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing that. And I love that you use that word confidence too, right? Because sometimes it could take just a small action of one adult to really help that student feel that way and feel like they can be successful. Thank you so much for sharing. We're looking forward to see what Hayes is going to continue to do as we move into the next year. Thank you. All right. So on this next slide, this is your opportunity to reflect on this particular section. So we're thinking about really fortifying those relationships between school what is it that you are able to do in your role to help us accelerate change in this area? And so we're going to go back to our Padlet. So I'll ask Carrie to post that, paste that link into the chat box for the Padlet, and you'll see the second column that's labeled school family relationships. Feel free to add your response there. And as you do that, I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next slide because I'm also watching our time. And this does give us take us to our break. And since it is after lunch, I definitely want to make sure that I honor the break that I promised to you. And so we're going to take a five minute break, but then please come back. And then we are going to move into our third component of our student engagement session. Feel free to turn off your video and I'm going to play some music for you. It is a song from Saul Paul that he wrote, an original song from Saul Paul that he wrote just for this ACE messaging and ACE campaign around student attendance, commitment and engagement. So I'll play that for you. When you hear the music stop, that'll be your cue to come back into the main room. Thank you so much and we'll see you in five minutes. <laughs> hey, what's up, fam? Hey, so far. Hey. hey, congratulations on graduation. Thank you for the invitation. I had to burn out early, but uh, I'm going to drop you the Addy and y'all come by the studio and shoot a music video. Yeah, I'm down. Yeah, me too. Yeah, for sure. sure. All right, that's what's up. All right, I'll see y'all then. Peace. Okay, bye. Peace. <laughs> So I had the ice to watch out. Know when it's time to work and time to clock out. That's why you treat school like it's a job. Every day show up and go hard. You know what I'm talking about? If you wanna shine, focus in school job. If you want everything, it's a good stop. But I got a super question, what's going on? When you ever quit, no, 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 like a beat, just what I make it. So I erase quick obstacles that I'm faced with. Haters hate, that's just motivation. Say what you say, I stay elevated. I was on the prize and education. It's in my fears with no hesitation. It's a sense, that's the destination. And I won't get sidetracked by things that don't make sense. I wanna apologize for my first photo of anything that's my best. I'ma represent it like it's all my own. Pick up two grams, I won't talk. This moment when I'm on my next step. And I'ma shout it, I'ma take it. I know that I'm about to graduate. Like you're testing out my answer. 
I'm about that life, you can tell that I'm with it. My action talk, yeah, they yell, I'm committed. Count me in, man, I'm filled with attendance. My bounce back is beautiful, I resilient. Place the trail, yeah, that path I had to pay. It. It's gonna go and sell that price, you have to pay it. I stayed engaged, now I'm really nothing to play with. Respect the dripping, I'm tripping my graduation, cuz. This is my moment, I'm on my stand. I know I'm shot and I'm take it. I know that I'm about to cry right now. Let's like test and I'm an essay. Let's like test and I'm an essay. Oh, give me a pass and I'm an essay. Oh, pay the time with the place. Let's like test and I'm an essay. Show up, show up, shine, repeat. Now is the time, the time to dream. Stay on your grind, in time you see all of your dreams live in 3D. All right. Well, I'm I'm enjoying the comments in the chat box there, my friends. I'm glad that you were enjoying the song there. That was such a beautiful project that we were able to collaborate with Saul Paul on. He really did, I think, beautifully capture and convey the essence of what we were wanting him to communicate in this video is that, you know, through these challenges and through these tribulations, we can still emerge and be successful. And we definitely want that for students. So welcome everybody back to the main room. We are going to continue now with the Next component, which is looking at equitable outcomes. So we are going to continue with the math example, because again, I really think that Pathways of Promise as an initiative, even though it's specific to the math context, please think about how this can be applicable to other content areas, because we are really just thinking about how can we as educators be willing to look at our current policies, our existing practices, and make them more equitable for students so that we do see those outcomes that are positive for all our students, Black, Hispanic, White, Asian, et cetera. And so on the slide here, you see again, a summary of some of the collaborative efforts that are happening to be able to help um, teach educators be able to support our diverse growing body of students, making sure that we lift their voices up and incorporate their voices. And so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. And for this piece, we are referring back to our ACE tagline again, our ACE messaging, but we're going to focus on engage. And if you see the definition of engage there, it's that students can engage, they can show that academic progress because they have that feeling of confidence and accomplishment. And so I'm going to share a couple of well, three data slides with you actually. And the first one right here has to do with completing algebra one in eighth grade. And you heard Kathy speak to that about the work they're doing in Hayes. And the reason this is important, because as I said before, we have data which shows that if students are able to access college aligned math or more rigorous math beyond algebra two when they get to high school, they are set up to be more successful in post-secondary in terms of enrollment, persistence, and completion. And so knowing that, it's important to look down the pipeline and really think about students being able to have access to accelerate in an advanced math in middle school. And so as a region, we track the, the percentage of students completing algebra one in eighth grade. And you'll see the results here on the screen. On the left-hand side, you see the percentage who are completing age, uh, algebra one by eighth grade. And the bottom, you see the year. So you can see over time that we are seeing some really positive things happen here. And what I want to point out is our Hispanic students in the green and then our Black students in that light blue. So even though those percentages are the lowest, you'll see that over time they are gradually increasing. And this is testament to the work that our partners who are understanding that these inequities exist in our systems, all the work that they are doing to really move the needle on this. Um, so you'll see there's still is quite a bit of work to do, but what I do want to highlight as a bright spot is that from 2019 to 2020, even in the pandemic, you see that those are really sort of, they're not dipping too much. And so I think that really is a sign of the perseverance of our students and educators um, as they navigated this last year that they held steady and were able to help students um, come to fruition with being able to complete this class in middle school. And so I already mentioned the college of land mass so this data slide you see here is representative of that. So you'll see the percentage of students in high school who are completing college of land math. And when I say college of land math, I'm referring to international baccalaureate, dual credit, and also your AP, your advanced placement classes. And so just take a look at this and you'll see that same um, that same gra uh, graduation, that same increase for our Black and Hispanic students over time, which is very positive. But again, because those percentages are lower, we know there's still work that needs to be done here. 
And again, from 2019 to 2020, you see it kind of holds steady in spite of everything we're hearing about learning loss and learning gaps. So really exciting to see this. However, I do want to share this next slide with you. And this is a slide that's not part of E3 data. This is something that we pulled from um, data that Commit was able to share with us. But this is based on an assessment that NWEA, which is a nonprofit, they, they were able to give this assessment. And the districts in Texas that participated, you'll see here what those results are. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the percentage of students who took the assessment in fall of 2019 and fall of 2020, the percentage that they deem as meeting proficiency and being able to do well on the star the following spring, which is the spring semester that just happened. And then you'll see the grade levels at the bottom on the horizontal axis. And I think the big takeaway that you probably already noticed is that because of the pandemic, probably, the difference between fall 2019 and fall 2020, you'll, you'll see from math, it decreased right in that year. And so I bring this up to not just harp on the importance of being able to make sure students are prepared for assessments, um, but it also ties back to that idea of helping students engage with their learning. Can they, can they illustrate this academic progress because they feel that being successful in the classroom? So we can make all sorts of ties and connections to the topic of conversation for this session. And so here, another pause for us to be able to reflect. Again, I offer you that same thinking hat protocol if you want to take this and add in the chat box any reactions you have to the data that we just shared. So how are we, um, how are we doing in terms of making sure that students can engage and that they feel like there's an adult in the room that feels they can be successful, and really fostering that growth mindset um, so that students feel that it's okay to make mistakes, that productive struggle is good, but if they keep at it, then they can definitely be successful and ace their school year. So I'm gonna move forward. And this time I would love to invite our friends from Mainer ISD here with us. And they're gonna share their story about what they've been doing in their district as a team to help students have this academic progress, but also feel like they can be confident and, and efficacious. And so I'm gonna invite our Mainer team to unmute and share their story. Um, so, um, <laughs> Hi, um, as a, a, a part of, um, of, um, of um, our district of pop and Nate, in a niche, initiatives. We um had um um eight a a good camp of piss says um to in in engage in a year projects of folk a good kiss on um um in a Ridge of a female students to um in a role in um in um ed of 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 advanced um math uh of course is 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 and of uh, builds editing as uh, self conf of 
uh, ends and uh, uh, taking a a a a a way of a bear rears. And as part of Thank you, Lisa. Um, as part of that uh, NAEP initiative, staff at Maynard High School um, planned and implemented two strategies that we want to highlight. Um, the first was women helping empower women, or or few, few. I like honestly don't know how to say it, so I put it in the chat so that we all know the W H E W that I'm talking about. Um, but that is a mentor group for girls um, that uses restorative justice um, and empowerment activities in order to promote and encourage self-efficacy and confidence, both socially and academically. And then the second strategy, and all of this was driven by the staff who participated in this NAEP work, um, was a campus-wide focus on the words that teachers use with scholars, um, which really helped shift the mindset of staff to be more focused on asset-based thinking. And so they provided written affirmative language scripts for staff in order to invite and encourage physical presence, engagement, and genuine scholar participation in learning. And this also influenced attendance um, because they shifted away from being demanding and threatening punitive consequences for attendance. Um, and instead, they were encouraging and incentivizing being in school. And so all of this work on positive language helped teachers foster that feeling of confidence and accomplishment in our scholars. And it was just really fantastic to see their focus on that foundation, um, which really comes from the staff and the words that teachers use. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you, Ashley, for sharing. And, and I couldn't stop smiling when you said moving away from that punitive, right? Because that helps us tie back to this idea of how can we use this ACE messaging to help students ACE their school year to help them attend, commit, engage within a very strength-based framework, right? That is culturally affirming, culturally sustaining. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I also want to just um, give a shout out to NAEP as well, who's one of our partners that we've been working with. We've just finished th three years with them now. And so we know that the opportunities they provide for us to be able to really look at um, those tendencies towards implicit bias and micro messaging that really does affect the language we use and hugely influences how we help students feel wellness and belonging and, and connected to this curriculum and that they can feel like they are, uh, are successful in the classroom. And so I know that we are, room is going to be closed in a couple of minutes. So it feels like I'm moving through the slides it is because I am. So I'm just going to fast forward and go back to the essential question. Hope that we were able to help you see that ACE, this overarching campaign that we've launched, we're so excited about it because we do see the potential to help students ACE their school year by focusing on this comprehensive approach that's strength-based, not just focus on attendance, but helping students commit and engage. And so please thank you, uh, help me thank the guest speakers that were with us today. And um, there is a link that Carrie's gonna post in the chat box. It does take you to a PowerPoint PDF version of the slideshow and then additional resources that, that you can use um, if you wanna explore a little bit further. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let, invite everybody, please unmute and just help me thank the speakers. Thank you guys for choosing to spend the afternoon with us deep diving into student engagement. And please do not miss the end keynote. I promise you, you will be blown away by the message and, and our call to action as we end the day and wrap up the summit. Thank you all so much. We'll see you back in the main room. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.